All right. So welcome back to this final session of the scientific symposium. We're almost, almost make it. Um, this is the final session of 89 sessions over five days. And as Steve will say, wow. Um, uh, in this final session, we will um, further explore the idea of heritage changes, and this time with the emphasis of a world heritage practice. Um, and it seems an appropriate place to end the scientific symposium as we switch over the weekend to extended 45th session of the World Heritage Committee, which will take place in Riyadh in the um, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia from the 10th until the 25th of September um, this year. And so I'm one of the ones who, with some of us, will be traveling to Saudi directly from Sydney, and it was possible. So we made it happen here, and we will make it happen in Saudi as well, thanks to these Super Express jets. Um, now I would like to commence this session uh, with a pre-recorded video message of Lazar Elundo Asomo, director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center. Could we please play the video? Dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UNESCO, I would like to warmly greet all delegates and members of e-commerce. I am honored to address you all at the General Assembly of E-Commerce International. And I'm sad that I have not been able to be with you in Sydney to take part in your fruitful exchanges and debates. As the House of Culture, UNESCO is a forum for critical and constructive discussions and work in heritage conservation. In this, E-Commerce long-standing role as UNESCO's partner has been crucial. Together with the two other advisory bodies, ECROM and IUCN, you have substantially contributed to the organization's mandate through the implementation of the culture's conventions. Safeguarding our planet's exceptional heritage for future generations is one of the most important tasks of the World Heritage Convention. And this is not an easy undertaking, as our common heritage is facing many and severe threats. One of the most common, or at least underestimated threats, is the general neglection caused by weak management. Further, the many development projects and the exploitation of natural resources in and around world heritage properties cause unsustainable use and uncertain futures. And finally, World Heritage Today reaches headlines connected to threats such as climate change, civil unrest and war, vandalism and looting. This makes our common heritage extremely fragile. At the same time, World Heritage is strong and resilient. One of the reasons why is the Convention's unique yet comprehensive focus on cultural and natural heritage, which for more than 50 years has fostered links between the safeguarding and management of the two. In this interlinkage of nature and culture, a thorough understanding and recognition of the value of traditional values, knowledge and management systems have also been increasingly reinforced, and with that, the understanding of the role of people. Because people bring meaning to world heritage, and world heritage brings meaning to people. It is indeed a source of knowledge, ownership, identity, and dignity for stakeholders on local as well as national levels that brings people together and fosters dialogue, relationships, collaboration, and responsibility. In this, the access to heritage is crucial, not only because it's a human right, 
but also because access is a prerequisite for the safeguarding of heritage as well as for ensuring the heritage contribution to a sustainable world. In 2015, culture through cultural heritage and creativity was given the role as an enabler of sustainable development in the Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Today, we realize that culture and heritage are much more than an enabler. The Mondial Declaration adopted last year in Mexico identified culture as a global public good and encouraged countries worldwide to include culture as a specific objective in its own right, in future national and international policies, as well as to fight for its inclusion in the next United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. How can we get ever better in this work in the months and years to come? Another subject in which heritage and people play a crucial role is in the present and future use of artificial intelligence. In 2021, UNESCO's member state agreed on the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. It stated that, and I quote, AI technology brings major benefits in many areas, but without the ethical guardrails, it risks reproducing real world biases and discrimination, fueling divisions and threatening fundamental human rights and freedoms. So, which potential and challenge will IA create for heritage? And how can heritage contribute to an ethically responsible and constructive way of using AI? What are our experiences thus far? I have used words such as resilience, responsibility, rights, and relationships. These are extremely important topics that resonate deeply with our times as well as have been central themes for your discussions at this General Assembly. Through this, e-commerce has again reaffirmed its commitment to its global actions for the protection of the world's cultural and natural heritage. In further, it has reaffirmed its long-term new approaches to heritage conservation and to forward-looking approaches to safeguarding our world's cultural diversity. Finally, rest assured that UNESCO is looking forward to learning about the discussions and the outputs from the General Assembly, as well as taking them into consideration in our own work in collaboration with you. Thank you. Thank you to Lazar, uh, to the World Heritage Center, to taking his time as well um, to share with us uh, some key words. Now, I would like to invite to the floor Professor Lynn Meskel. It's my pleasure to introduce her. Lynn Meskel is Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor Department of the Department of Anthropology at the Penn Museum, Weizmann School of Design, University of Pennsylvania, and A.D. White Professor at Large Cornell University. Lynn, the stage is yours. Thank you, I love this idea of having the step. <laughs> so thank you, Lynn. Um, I will ask Lynn to come back, please, and take a seat. And I would like to introduce now our panelists to the stage. They are Chrissy Grant, Kukuyan Yalanyi and Mogal, Chair of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum, 
Wewe Nadoro, Director General of ICROM. Don't be scared, please join me on stage. Tim Batman, Director, Heritage and Culture Team, Center for Society and Governance at IUCN. Teresa Patricio, President of ICOMOS. And congratulations, because she's still the President of ICOMOS. <laughs> and Steve Brown, who will moderate this panel. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Una. And just before we start, I am um, on a personal campaign for Kylie for World Heritage, just so you can be contemplating that. Well, thank you, Lynn, for that presentation. Um, so to begin this discussion, I'm going to ask each of the panellists to provide a brief response to the evidence indicating that World Heritage Inscription is in and of itself a driver of increased conflict. So Chrissy, if I can start with you, um, what were you thinking about when you saw the data being presented? And is this something you've been aware of in your work in the International Indigenous Peoples Forum? Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> Very much aware that there needs to be change and a big change, particularly when it looks at um, the acknowledgement and recognition of Indigenous peoples and the, and the, the heritage that, and values that they have across landscapes, even across where buildings are now, because that once upon a time was their hunting ground or their meeting place. And so we've heard in the course of this uh, symposium stories just like that, where, you know, sort of they are um, now doing things in the metropolitan area that was once upon a time, um, you know, sort of uh, an area where Aboriginal people um, and Indigenous peoples have, um, you know, frequented or occupied. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, Tim, if I can turn to you from the perspective of IUCN as an advisory body to the World Heritage Committee, what were you reflecting on during the presentation? Yeah, well, thank, thanks, Steve, and thanks, thanks Lynn. I, I, I was reflecting not only as IUCN, but because I came into, I, in, came into World Heritage writing a nomination from where I'm from and rem remembering what it was like waiting, waiting for this anonymous uh, international organization to turn up with a clipboard and tell us whether we were doing a good job or not. Um, I, I mean, I, lots of things I thought are really helpful is the first thing to have real data. Um, most, mostly, I think what we're trying to wrestle with with World Heritage is a very data poor system that has a lot of anecdote in it. And, uh, and I guess my main thing was wanting disaggregate, disaggregated data uh, laying around where we can see things that work better and things that work worse, because we tend to see the, the, the system surfacing things that, that, that don't work. And then I just had, I, I guess for the system, four things that immediately came to mind. Um, th the first is the disconnection between the World Heritage Convention and local effort, and there's still very low, low expectations. Um, if I go back to 2001, after eight years of um, work to get on the World Heritage List, the letter from UNESCO says, please could you put up a plaque, love and kisses, UNESCO, there's very little um, engagement in a, in a movement to try to make things better. The second is the real need for safeguards that are modern, you know, that, that see we're looking for good things out of World Heritage, but where, where, where do we assure that, that uh, normal safeguards for uh, problems are, uh, are dealt with? The, the third is really putting site managers and, and, site and communities and site level actors into the convention, which we're trying to do with ICOMOS and ICROM through the leadership program. And the last is we do have some experience of the convention's own mechanisms being a redress mechanism, and I think we need to see the state of conservation reporting and the expectations translating into redress and action sometimes for very long-standing conflicts that are uh, assimilated into the World Heritage Convention and we're really dealing with, as we uh, saw with the, uh, the, the, the Tasman, you know, I, IUCN's terrible um, language in 1982 about Tasmania where we've uh, had, you know, re withdrawn um, really problematic uh, past practice from, uh, from circulation. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, Teresa, from the perspective of ICOMOS as an advisory body to the World Heritage Committee, what thoughts were you having during the presentation? Yes, thank you very much, Lynn, for this presentation. I th it's uh, 
very important and very interesting what you present to us here. Um, yes, um, we feel that if we read the convention, if we read the convention, we know that the, the first intention it was a peacemaking convention. But uh, of course, we we know that the reality is quite different, and uh, this starts from the moment of inscription onwards, and we have more and more uh, inscribed sites, and uh, perhaps less and less good actions of conservation and man and effective management. And something, something that is also concerning us very much is this missing, um, uh, the, the fact that we are missing perhaps to develop good uh, management plans also with an effective risk management. And this is very important because sites, when the moment we inscribe a site, this site is a target, we know that. And, but we are not taking this into consideration when we are, man, uh, when we are preparing the management plans. Um, about the communities and the inclusion of the communities, we are very much aware, aware of that, of course. And we are changing even uh, in e-commerce very much the way of doing the evaluations of new nominations. And we had just very, very recently, these two, three years, we are really introducing new, new kind of, um, we are asking specific experts on right-based approach and inclusion of communities. And I really hope that this will have some effect on afterwards on the inscription. But this is our evaluation. E-commerce only does evaluation. But uh, I think you touch a very, very important. Because we are inscribing for a positive, for, for preserving heritage for future, and uh, perhaps we are causing some conflict. And this is really, we need to take care of that. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. And, and of course, that adds to, I guess, the work of doing evaluations in the sense of how do we perceive or recognize conflict and potential conflict in a world heritage situation. So thank you for those words. Uh, Weber, if I can turn to you um, from the perspective of ICROM, what were you thinking about, and in particular the work of the World Heritage Leadership Program, which ICROM is so ably coordinating? Thank you. Thank you. Before I come to the World Heritage Leadership Program, let me first of all thank Len for a wonderful presentation. I just, want, I just wanted to say that uh, one of the major problems which creates conflict at World Heritage Sites is lack of information. And that lack of information emanates from the whole process of how nominations are done. Uh, I, for one, I worked at a World Heritage Site for four years. I didn't know that the site was on the World Heritage List. But government had put it on the World Heritage List. Nobody knew that it was there. So, of course, things have improved a little bit with time, but I still think that we need more to make sure that the process itself engages other people. It's not just the government and professionals. It is involving communities. And I'm happy that uh, uh, during this uh, General Assembly, I saw a lot of efforts to include communities and making sure that they are part and parcel of this. Uh, again, the whole issue of uh, everything being based on experts I think we need to move away from that and make sure that these sites are being nominated for people. It is not just for government, it's for people. It's not competition among government uh, organizations. Thanks for pointing out to the World Heritage Leadership Program. I should thank uh, IUCN for that. And uh, it's a program which basically looks at nature and culture as one thing. And I think quite a lot of the conflicts uh, which Len is pointing out, actually emanate from this idea of looking at culture on one side and nature or on the other side. In my continent, Africa, uh, when a site is declared a nature site, in fact, before it's declared, it's usually declared as a national park, and what happens? People are moved out of that to make sure that the nature is pristine. I'm not so sure what pristine means because the people had been there when all these animals and you know vegetation was there, but now, because it's being declared, it's even with cultural sites in a country like Botswana, when Tsolilo Hills was declared, it's a rock art site, but it was declared a world heritage site. They had to move people out of it, and that in itself 
creates conflict. And the program on World Heritage Leadership Program is trying to address some of those issues so that we look at heritage as something which is just combined. It's both nature and culture. It's heritage, basically. Uh, I always say that we look at nature through the lenses or the eyes of culture. Uh, I give the example of usually Europeans, when they come to Africa, they talk about the big five. Uh, if you ask an African, they are not going to include the leopard or even the lion as the big five. That's not their big five. This is the big five coming from the West, and that's what they want to protect. And how do we make sure that the interests of the others is taken into consideration? And that's what the leadership program is trying to do for the past 10 years. I think we have worked uh, successfully in trying to inculcate the spirit of looking at World Heritage Sites as combined, as something which belongs to the people and not this scientific issue of saying, no, this is nature, no, this is culture. I think if we are to improve management, we have to move beyond this so-called scientific categorization and that's what World Heritage Leadership Program is trying to do. Thank you very much. And I, I think um, um, picking up on some of the points in these um, opening remarks, I do want to turn to the overarching theme of the GA 2023 of heritage changes, which I'm sure you all know by now. Um, and whether, if I can stick with you, um, from your experience here at the GA 2023, um, what have you picked up on about what is changing in the field of heritage and are these changes a good thing? The change which I've picked up is the whole emphasis on people or indigenous community. In my view, I've never been to uh, an ICOMOS meeting or World Heritage meeting where we have emphasized this. And my hope is that it is not just lip service. It is something which we really mean to do. And from what I could gather, it seems we are all serious about this. And to me, it's a big change. I hope, I hope this change on including perspectives from communities, indigenous people, and so forth, also get to World Heritage Committee meetings uh, so that it's not just about governments, it is about the other voices. And that's the most important thing I can say I have picked up myself and I'm happy that Australia is in the forefront. Please make sure that the other countries follow you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and Chrissy, if I can um, turn to you again, um, you've been very engaged in um, the indigenous heritage content of GA 2023. I think you've appeared in many things, um, which is fantastic. Um, what change did you see that can be a force for good or otherwise? Just before I answer that one, <coughs> I've had a, 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 a new thought about the data stuff. Um, because what, uh, Nodora mentioned information and it is very often that the information is not correct, particularly if it's been written in, you know, sort of very early, early times by government or colonisers and even researchers. So, I mean, the information and it has, you know, I have personal experience of this where in 1991, FPIC, or free prior informed consent, was still not being done. And so when we looked at the information, we found that the facts were not right. So quite often you have to go back to the community, if you can, to be able to um, get somebody to verify whether that is correct. Yes, ground toothing. So, but yes, for me, it has been the Indigenous um, program, heritage program. Um, I was pleasantly surprised. I've never been to one of these before. <laughs> but I was pleasantly surprised that there was such an um, inclusion of Indigenous heritage um, in its own stream. But that meant that we couldn't go to rights and all the others. But that's the, that's the way it is in conferences. Um, 
but it's I think it's on the verge of a change. I think ICOMOS is on the verge of a change and an important one um, that will, you know, sort of have an impact on not only the cultural um, side of things such as buildings and architect and those sorts of things, but they've spread, and you have to keep up with the times, they've spread to AI and, you know, IT and all the rest of it, but to, to look at, you know, sort of where the impact can be um, for Indigenous peoples in, you know, sort of heritage conservation, I think is a big move and a really welcome one from the Indigenous peoples. Great. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, I, I think um, it's been magnificent to see the uh, resolution on Indigenous inclusion um, uh, taken forward by ICOMOS. Um, I, I'm probably of the view, well I am of the view, that it will take a lot of guidance to, to translate that into meaningful um, r results. And I think um, ICOMOS, the board, um, the national committees will really rely on people like yourself, um, other Indigenous and First Nations people who are attending today to, to give some um, advice and direction in that. So we greatly appreciate all the work that you've done um, in this conference. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Tim, you've engaged with the Culture Nature Journey at GA 2023, as well as at the previous journeys from 2016, aimed at better integrating the work um, of natural and cultural heritage. So what change have you um, seen arising from GA 2023 that bodes well for the future journeys? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, I guess the first thing is that it's great that we're still here. Um, and um, I, I think what's been notable here, first, firstly just to echo the comment about uh, the recognition here at, at the GA of Indigenous peoples in such a important way and with the resolutions. Um, yeah, IUCN, we're, we've been on that journey for a little longer and in 2016 we opened up a category of uh, membership in IUCN for Indigenous people organisation uh, members and we, but we also know as Chrissy says that you know that there are enormous challenges that every part of a system and world heritage is uh, you know part, part of a, a, la a larger um, set of concerns across the nature conservation nature conservation movement about the place and primacy and agency of indigenous peoples uh, the legacy issues that face many protected and conserved areas not only those uh, on the world heritage list so I think probably the first thing is to see that that um, connection has come forward here and to have an indigenous uh, heritage stream that's um, been wrapping itself together with the nature culture journey throughout um, throughout the event. Um, I, I guess the other thing that's been really positive, personally positive from my point of view, is, to, is the decision that was uh, um, invited to have the nature culture journey led by emerging professionals who then involved even more emerging professional voices in, in the leadership of that, apart from giving me a much uh, different experience of um, attending and not trying to coordinate the event, I think just to enable this to be um, a, a discussion which really accelerates uh, and here's the, here's the views of emerging professionals has been another, another significant change. I, I, I guess what I think, just a closing, closing point um, on the nature culture journey though, is we've, we've got to a point where we should be more focused in how we move things forward between IUCN and ICOMOS. It feels to me in terms of the discussion we've got there. You know, it's not a kind of debate whether nature is separate or distinct from culture. It, you know, we, we're recognizing in really throughout the program that this is a, this was a stupid idea in the first place and the fact that we perpetuated for 50 years should be a source of, uh, um, you know, a, a source of reflection, but we've, we've um, got, got to a better place. But I think we do now need to be much more um, purposeful about moving the agenda forward in discrete areas of practice uh, where we can really advance impact in ways that are um, focused and tailored to the different challenges and the challenges of uh, giving Indigenous people's voice the need to re, from my point of view, sorry to um, t tackle this one, but to, to rethink cultural landscapes as something that might have been a helpful label at the time, but now should be really seen as a universal concept of biocultural landscapes. I think to bring urban experiences into this discussion in a way that we haven't, um, and to really tackle the issue of the lack of linguistic 
diversity that has skewed so much of uh, decades and even centuries of practice. So I think there's a lot we should do to now put our finger on some big and challenging issues. And uh, with Teresa, I think, uh, beside me, to, to, to move this work outside of the World Heritage Box as well. You know, this, there's a chance to really engage with the global biodiversity framework, and that's what we should be talking about, I think, in the next, uh, in the next decade. Thoughts after my own heart. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Um, Teresa, so you've, I've said to you earlier, you've been to everything at GA 2023, you said not quite. Um, but what excites you about the changes that you have seen coming out of GA 2023 for the work of ECOMOS? Yes, uh, I think it's today, ECOMOS is changing. And uh, it's not only that the conference was changing, but it's ECOMOS. We are, it's, it's the day of today, it's a milestone in our work because I think the approval of the, rec of the, the resolutions this morning, it uh, will oblige us to think about ourselves and the way of we work. And perhaps also to rethink on uh, our values and how to, to read the values of heritage. And uh, so I think we are in a, in a very important moment of shifting. And uh, this is for me, the, it, was, it was fantastic to see this morning uh, the approval of the resolutions and, and after and this afternoon to see the, the summaries of the of the of the of the symposium because the things are very much related and uh, I think this it's uh, it's fantastic so for me I, it's yeah the most important we we had a very huge discussion in NARA with for discussing values of heritage but now we need to go more deep heritage is not for people heritage is people. We make part of the ecosystem. We need to, posi to, again, to review how we put communities, indigenous, ourselves, in the reading of the values of heritage. For me, this is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Lynn, um, um, I'd like to turn back to you. And um, I did have another question, which I'll come to. But I'm just wondering, from what you've heard um, from our other panelists, um, responding uh, to your presentation and beyond in the theme of heritage changes. What kind of reflections are you having about on hearing this? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you uh, to, the, to the panel. I mean, it's very heartening to hear everything. Obviously, it's been uh, very motivating and very positive. I've never been to a, a GA like this. And it is so different from World Heritage Committee meetings, <laughs> if I can just say that as uh, somebody who doesn't work for any particular agency. Uh, I think the question is, how do we carry forward the momentum and progress that may be signaled here towards World Heritage, towards World Heritage meetings, particularly with states parties? And when I think about the, the constituents that we all have to deal with, um, the nation states, the member states, are really a key part. They are our governments. We may be communities or minorities within those, dealing with those governments as well. So if we want to look after people and communities within nations, then our leaders are going to have to do something different as well. So how to get affect that change for the nominating countries and they, those big power brokers and the deals that are being done of which we are generally excluded from. And that's a tougher one. And that's why it's great to be on such a panel because you are the people who have their ear at some points and have the power, I think, in some ways to hold them accountable. And then maybe we have to learn something from both indigenous activists and the environmental lobby that maybe more naming and shaming needs to happen. But we're gonna have to do something fast because the results I show even I found so devastating to see that for 1,200 and, uh, yeah, whatever, 57 sites globally, it doesn't matter whether they were natural sites or cultural sites, the pattern holds. It doesn't matter whether they're in conflict on the danger list or not, that is the pattern. So something's going to have to change. And I appreciate very much what everyone said about, well, ICOMOS wants to change, the resolutions will change things, but governments also need to be aware that they're harming their own people in the promises they make, that then they, then they renege on, um, that they're building uh, factories and mines and exploiting people or moving them off or promising them jobs and then don't deliver. The conflict that I was demonstrating there, the incredible amount of millions and millions of pieces of data together 
to say that people are not happy and that they are the victims. It doesn't even get to the point of the conservation of sites. We are just talking about public sentiment, about people's uh, sort of outrage, the negative sentiment. So, so that's the missing piece that's not represented here in a way, although there are many delegates, I'm sure, that will report to national bodies, but that's the other, that's the other power group that, that needs to change. And following on a little bit from that, um, uh, given you said that um, the three advisory bodies to the World Heritage Committee have that ear of the committee at moments, um, uh, what kind of things do you think by working, ICRAM, uh, IUCN and ICOMOS working together could kind of um, push toward? Not too heavy a question. If I had the answer to that, uh, yeah, I might be running the UN or something. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it is, <laughs> it's very difficult. I mean, the representatives here probably have a better idea. But when when member states are so desperate, and we know they are so desperate to have their sites inscribed, there is that window of of influence, and they are on display, as it were. Uh, and I think they also need to know the results of such meetings. You know, it's really a shame, it's really a shame that they can't be here, in a sense. And it's a shame that this is not reflected within the World Heritage Committee meetings that are going to start next week. This is exactly what, um, what they need to see. So, I, I don't know, I think we perhaps, this group is probably more powerful than it, than it may imagine, but we're gonna have to get creative and probably being Australian, I think we probably have to be a little bit angry. Um, but I'm not a diplomat, so. <laughs> yeah, perhaps if I can, uh, thank you very much for the, the remarks you just did. I think it, they are really very important. And uh, it's only to tell something that ECOMOS, since uh, two years, we, um, we believe that uh, in cultural diplomacy, we believe on discussing, on sharing our concerns. And so, two, since two years ago, we decided to open dialogue with the delegations in UNESCO. So we are, to, and the intention is really to open the dialogue, to share with them what our main values, how we work, how, what are our beliefs. And I think this is a, a, a work that should continue. And this year we had a very big meeting with uh, 80 delegations were present, uh, Tim was there with us. And I think this work needs to continue and is more and more important. Yes. Yeah, yeah uh, I think I have had uh, experience as a site manager, as um, yeah, also working for the government and working for an advisory advisory uh, body. I think it's important for us to understand the nature of the convention. There are member states who join, and member states are political entities in as much as we may not uh, like that idea. And as advisory bodies, we want to be very professional which is fine. I, I think uh, that's what we should try and do to bring out the best of science onto the table and making sure that the sites are looked after. But I also think that, uh, and again here I'm not speaking as Ikram, I'm speaking just as an individual here. I also think that there needs to be movements of change within the Secretariat of UNESCO. In my view, from my own experience, I think they should be the secretariat. And what do I mean by that? Even information to member states should come from the secretariat. They should be also in a position where there are conflictual things between, let's say, what the advisory bodies are saying and what the member state wants. They should be the ones who should try and reconcile, right? so that uh, the member states don't feel like, oh, you know, it's the advisory bodies who don't want my site to be nominated. Uh, I think it's, it's not that, but it has to be explained to them. Again, it goes back to what I was saying about information. At times, I, I, I think that the Secretariat acts also as uh, experts. And in my view, that creates a problem with member states. Uh, I think 
the member states should also have a place to go. Uh, if ICOMO says your site cannot be nominated because of A, B, C, D, they should be able to go to, 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 to the Secretariat and say, can you explain? What can I do? How do you convince the member states? So that's one thing which I think, in my view, uh, may be necessary to improve. I'm not saying that World Heritage is not working properly. It, it is working. But I'm talking about improving the situation and reducing the political conflict. Just one last thing. Yes, the word, uh, Tim, the word bioculture is already in use, particularly with a lot of universities. So it's coming to World Heritage, I'm sure, soon. Thank you. And just before you jump in, Tim, um, I'm always aware on panels that the missing party is often uh, the one that is most discussed. So um, uh, we're, it's a shame Lazar could not be here to respond to um, his, well, to, to give his reflections on um, uh, the UNESCO World Heritage Centre. Tim, please. Yeah, well, well so I guess the, the, the first thing, so, we, so I, for IUCN, we're about next week to launch a, a new World Heritage Strategy, which is, and I was wanting to connect a bit this discussion to the earlier session this afternoon, where I think there was a sort of general mood around, you know, ICOMOS should reflect on sort of where does World Heritage fit in, what we really all want to do, rather than, you know, what, what, what World Heritage is for. IUCN is a little bit different because World Heritage is really quite a small part of what IUCN does, sort of 1% one, 1 of our global, global effort. Um, and, uh, and the new, you know, voice we want to bring, I mean, in some ways it's an old voice for, for World Heritage is, you know, there, ha there have to be results for places and people, but this has to be an exercise in, in, in inspiring good practice. You know, it's not a little kind of box and a boutique uh, that, you know, should, should be protecting a, a thousand sites. It should actually be a place to test whether we're doing good, good or not. And, and I guess in this, uh, you know, Lazar's not here and I've never worked for government, um, but there are a lot of people that work for government in the room and I've worked with a lot of people that work for government. And I, and I, do, I would want to sort of push back against the view that there's some sort of inherent model of, you know, government are against good results and communities want good results. I, I, you know, I genuinely think the World Heritage Convention is mostly full of people that are trying to move towards good, good results out of the convention, and that inclu includes the states parties. Uh, and, and I suppose I'd just pick on maybe three, three things that we could do that we're not um, doing. No, we're gonna put, put on four things that we should, should, should do, in fact. Um, the, 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 first, the first is to support the International Indigenous Peoples Forum for World Heritage as a officially recognized organization by the World Heritage Committee to be properly funded and properly constituted um, and present in the same way as IUC and ICOMOS and ICROM in the discussion. Um, and then if I just turn more to the system, um, you, you know, I think we have very few metrics, just back to my earlier point, Lynn, you know, it's great to have a presentation like that and kind of try to quick, quickly read it, but yeah, you know, I'd like to dig in and get behind the data and use that data. Um, it and will in be IUCN, published. It you know, will we, be published. Yeah, in IUCN, we created the World Heritage Outlook for the sites listed for nature conservation value, sites formerly known as natural sites, um, that um, really reflected the system knew nothing about two-thirds of the sites. You know, reactive monitoring in the convention just follows the bad news and it doesn't really look at anything synoptically. And there's nothing like that for, um, for, for, for sites listed for cultural heritage values. So we don't really have a system that speaks to the whole quality of what's going on. So I think good metrics, good data, and something to benchmark change against would really, would really um, help. Um, and then I, and then, so metrics as a whole and accountability, something like the World Heritage Outlook. Um, voice for communities and voice for other parties. The, big, the best correction of things not working out at site level, in my experience, has been other voices in the room, um, because at the end of the day, the advisory body doesn't speak for disempowered parts of the community. It's somehow we've got to find ways that the convention feels like that. And we contrast NIUC and the World Heritage Committee with pretty much every other environmental meeting we go to, where it's very, very light on, you know, incredibly light on civil society participation as a whole. So how do we do something about that? And then the third is what works, because I guess that would be my question, Lynn. You know, you gave one example of a, a counterfactual to your general picture. Well, you know, let, let's look at the places where it isn't a negative story, and let's look at why that's not the case, and then let's build 
uh, you know, build, build positive examples to be more replicable positive examples. So, yeah, I guess those would be my few things. Great. Thank you, Tim. Um, so we are, um, time has flown, um, and, and a good panel is a panel that ends on time. Um, so I, I would just like to finally put to the panel, one minute or so each, um, what's one ma way, main way, and Tim has touched on a number, which you would like to see the operationalising of the World Heritage Convention change in the coming decade? Perhaps, Teresa, I'll start with you. Yes, thank you. The way of the, for the management of the sites and the conservation of the sites in a holistic way with all... Uh, Part, all actors really working together for the conservation of the site. This, uh, I think it's um, our big um, challenge because we continue inscribing and uh, we are not taking care of, of what we are inscribing correctly. And so this is a big concern. Well, the one thing I haven't said, which is a boring point to end on, and I'm sorry to make it, is that there's a real, there's a real need to increase capacity across the advisory bodies, but especially to support the capacity that there is in, in ICOMOS. And I think we really should be, you know, my earlier point about making things operational is, is looking for partners and supporters to build um, a program which is not focused on the advisory body work, but is focused on these opportunities to, 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 to build a World Heritage System beyond the, uh, the requests from the, World, from the World Heritage Committee that's actually more effective. And I, you know, the, the over, this won't happen with the currently over, highly overstretched ICOMOS team we've got. It'll happen because we can support that team to become larger and better supported. Yeah, I think the World Heritage Convention itself, the aim is to improve the management system of both cultural and natural heritage sites. And I hope that uh, we can get back to that rather than to some, you know, uh, sort of amorphous issues like, in my view, the whole issue of OUV as the sort of, you know, panacea or the, 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 the thing which we should be aiming at. I think what we should be looking at is how do we make sure that the, the sites are being managed properly for the benefit of the communities, not for the benefit of experts. Uh, the issue, again, in terms of if we are to make the OUV work properly, I think we have to look at how do we include the different views of the universe or of the universe from different voices rather than from just a Western perspective of what uh, a world heritage is about. I've always said in my articles that if you look at Africa, 60 to 70 percent of the sites are basically colonial or archaeological sites. They have got nothing to do with Africa. And I'm just saying that maybe we need to move towards a more diverse universe than a single perspective. Chrissy, thanks. Um, yeah. I, the change I see um, could be massive and could be really life-changing for people in the community. Um, if, you know, sort of over the next uh, few years and that until, I think you said 2030. Um, but I do see that, you know, there's an opportunity there for um, the Indigenous Forum, which I chair, and, and that to work with, you know, the existing advisory bodies and to get to the stage for ourselves to actually be having a network of Indigenous people that can be the assessors as well. Um, you know, we, that needs to be built. I mean, there's a, there's a network across Australia that, you know, I'm quite aware of, but it needs to be global and um, becoming more and more aware of different people that are outside of Australia who are Indigenous and who are quite um, competent and, and have the qualifications to do that assess, assessment and you know sort of at some stage I think um, you, it's the implementation of of policies and programs and and that that is already with UNESCO they've got a um, you know our common dignity for instance on the rights-based approach uh, that was um, 
over a number of years through ICOMOS Norway. Um, and I participated in one of them. And, you know, sort of the, they now have a common, uh, our common dignity initiative. Um, there's also, um, you know, sort of the policy to engage with Indigenous people, but I'm not quite seeing it being implemented. Um, so the, I think the implementation is a big thing. And, you know, sort of if they had the will and the heart to, to actually do it properly, and that might mean that, you know, sort of there's some Indigenous peoples that are engaged and work within the centre, um, particularly, you know, around World Heritage and particularly to have as focal points and that, um, you know, sort of there's, there's certainly scope and room to, to actually move and, and we could be a different world in 2030. Mm. Um, you know, sort of, I, th I think it's time for the Indigenous peoples to, to rise. I'll just leave it at that. Great final word. L uh, and Lynn, um, what sparkling comment will you finish with? That's a very hard act to follow. Um, I, I have to say, and maybe it's uh, slightly an answer to Tim as well, but I, I think we're already seeing the start of it. And I think it's so interesting that my colleagues out of 1,257 sites picked Budge Bim, uh, Americans, not the Australian, we do have a way forward. We do have already one good example. Writing on stone, the Canadian example, another good one. Uh, Murujugo, if that happens, that would be a third. Like, this is building towards something. This would really change the system and inspire others. So that, that would be one major change that I think is, is possible, is happening. The other would be to allow civil society more than two minutes to respond when a site is nominated and before a decision is made and that we hear that human rights have been violated, people have been evicted, people have disappeared after a site has been enshrined and celebrated. That has got to happen at the World Heritage Meetings and that's something that is implementable and is, is able to be changed. It's very simple things and we have some models to follow. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> In closing this panel, I think it's only fair to give the final word to the diva herself, Kylie Minogue, who, of course, famously sang Better the Devil You Know, but I don't think that's an appropriate song, I'm sorry to say, Kylie, in this circumstance. So please join me in sincerely thanking the panel for their willingness to engage in this conversation and sharing their insights and aspirations. Please thank Chrissy Grant, Teresa Patricio, Tim Badman, Weber and Doro, and our guest speaker, Lynn Meskell. Thank you so much. Uh, could I invite our um, emerging professionals panelists, if you could just hang in there for one moment. Tim, Weber, uh, our emerging professionals, do we have you here? Please come to the stage. <laughs> Uh, Lynn, if you can hang in as well. They have a gift for you all. <laughs> no, 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 it's not an um, a inclusive performance here. Thank you. I think there is some sim symbolism in the passing on of the gifts there. <laughs> uh, if you could just look at the camera, there's a photo now, a photo opportunity, unusual as it has been through this whole two weeks. Another round of applause, thank you. Thank you so much, panellists and gift givers. <laughs> so this, this panel discussion um, marks um, the end of the GA 2023 Scientific Symposium. So please join me in thanking all those that contributed to making the Scientific Symposium such a rich and amazing experience. I salute you all. Thank you.
Um, it is now my pleasure to welcome to the stage Caitlin Allen, a member of the GA 2023 Scientific Committee, to introduce our audience event. Caitlin, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Steve. Well, while the stage is being reset, which will hopefully start happening in a minute, um, it is my very great pleasure to introduce the closing performance of this scientific symposium of the 21st ICOMOS General Assembly. As Steve mentioned, I'm an Australia ICOMOS representative on the scientific committee that has been working together over the last six years to guide the development of the scientific symposium and its themes. The committee, and in particular our wonderful co-chairs Steve and Ona, wanted to do something very special to mark this closing moment. This scientific symposium has been a work of collaboration, not only in its preparation, but while you have all been here together in person over the last nine days. Whether you have been an audience member, offering thoughts and asking probing questions, a presenter, a session chair, a discussant, or have had another role, each of you have played a part in the robust, sometimes challenging, but also inspiring conversations about changing heritage practice and how heritage can change us and be a force for change in the present and future that we want to create together. With that in mind, we approached Australian composer Alice Chance and asked her to create an original work that not only responds to the heritage conservation mission of ICOMOS and the themes of this General Assembly, but is something that you can all feel a part of. It is our way of saying thank you and farewell to all of you. Alice Chance is an Australian composer, conductor, singer, artist and educator, currently based in Paris, so we were very lucky that she is able to join us here in person today. Her works are performed everywhere from concert halls to paddocks, and she has worked with many of Australia's most dynamic ensembles, including the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, Ensemble Offspring, Gondwana Choirs, the Australian Brandenburg Orchestra, and the Garibsik Torres Strait Islander Corporation, to name only a few. As you will experience today, her music often has a playful twist, and it's important to her that her listeners and performers feel welcome within it. Audience Choir Layers of Heritage is a work that is both thoughtful and innovative. We were very excited, and I have to say very impressed, with Alice's proposal for this work, not only because of its clever use of technology, but because it responded to her understanding of the layers of heritage embedded in this place where we have been meeting on Gadigal land, on the shores of Darling Harbour, and on the doorstep of the vibrant Chinatown precinct. To reflect these layers of heritage, Alice has collaborated with Box of Chocolates, a duo who will join her on stage this afternoon. Like Alice, their work is embedded in collaboration and fostering cross-cultural understanding. Murriwa George Dow is a musician, singer, songwriter and dancer with ancestry from Murray Island in the Torres Strait and also from Cape York Peninsula. Connecting song lines on the east coast of Australia from far north to south and sharing knowledge of First Nations culture is his life's work. Chloe Chung is a cross-cultural flautist playing both Western flute and Ditsu, the Chinese bamboo flute. She teaches at both the Australian Institute of Music and the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. Through their collaboration, this work not only reflects the cultural heritage of this place, but also the universal layers of cultural heritage. It is based around four layers of land, ocean, day sky and night sky. Within the music, you will hear Murray was speaking in Torres Strait language Maryam Mir, telling a story of the sun and moon coming together in an eclipse to represent the idea of coming together that happens both in this work and as we have all come together this week. In a moment, Alice will explain how you will be able to use both your mobile phones and your voices uh, to co-create this work, choosing a layer of heritage to contribute to the soundscape. Each layer is different, but with common elements that will join together to create a whole. We'd like to note that this session is being recorded and photographed and will be available online after the closing of the General Assembly. So we ask you to please stay in the moment and only use your phones to join in the performance and not to make your own video or photographic recording. We also ask 
that you turn your sound right up for the performance, but please don't press play on your link until you are invited to. So now I invite you to join together one last time to co-create this work with Alice, Mariwa and Chloe and hope you'll find this to be a magical end to the scientific symposium of this 21st General Assembly. It is now my very great pleasure to hand you over to Alice, who will guide you through this very special performance. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, et bonsoir tout le monde. Uh, myself, Chloe, and Uncle Mariwa are absolutely delighted to be here. Moi-même, Chloe, et Oncle Mariwa sommes absolument ravis d'être ici avec vous for this world premiere of this new arrangement of Audience Choir, pour cette création mondiale de ce nouvel arrangement de Audience Choir. Uh, thank you so much, Caitlin, for that beautiful introduction. Un grand merci à vous, Caitlin, pour uh, cette belle, int belle introduction. Uh, for this performance, I will need two things from everybody. Pour uh, cette performance, j'aurai besoin de deux choses de tout le monde. The first is your phones. Le premier, vos portables. Could you please put them on silent if they are not already on silent? Mettez-les sur mode silencieux, s'il vous plaît, si ce n'est pas déjà fait. And now the volume. Can we have it at about halfway, please? Le son à peu près au milieu. Pas trop fort, pas trop doux. Not too loud, not too soft. Right about halfway. How are we tracking so far? We're all good? Parfait. Um, now I would like to invite you to scan the QR code that you will see above to contribute to the musical layers of this work. Je vous invite à scanner ce QR code pour contribuer aux couches sonores de cette œuvre. Uh, we don't want any front runners. <laughs> Attendez. Um, you will see four options. Vous aurez quatre options. And uh, once you have chosen, please press submit and click the link, but don't start playing the video. Une fois que vous aurez choisi, tapez submit. Cliquez sur le lien, mais s'il vous plaît, ne commencez pas à lire la vidéo. Very good. And the second, show, the second thing that I will need from everybody is your voices. La deuxième chose dont j'aurai besoin, c'est vos voix. Uh, but don't be scared. Chloe, Mariwa and I will guide you every step of the way. N'ayez pas peur. On vous guidera à chaque étape de cette œuvre. Um, all that we have to do now is perform the piece. Is everyone ready with your videos? Il nous reste qu'à faire la pièce ensemble. I invite you to stand if possible. Mettez-vous debout si possible. And when my hand reaches you, I'd like you to start pressing play on the video. Une fois que ma main est en lien avec vous, tapez go sur la vidéo. Is everyone ready? Vous êtes prêts? Yes! <laughs> oui. <laughs> Wonderful. Are you guys ready? Yes. volume up a little bit.
Bitte. A hard act to follow. Thank you so much to Alice, George and Chloe. To close the ICOMOS 21st Triennial General Assembly and Scientific Symposium, please welcome to the stage Professor, Professor Tracy Ireland, President of Australia ICOMOS and President of GA 2023. For this closing, for this closing we also call upon Teresa Patricio our fantastic ICOMOS president to join us on the stage. Tracy and Teresa, the two T's powerhouse, have managed to be everywhere all the time and we welcome you to the stage. Tracy, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Steve. What a fabulous um, end to this amazing event these 156 events over 10 days, and the incredible engagement by you, the GA 2023 delegates. So as I draw the GA 2023 to a close, members of the co executive committee and Helen Lardner, chair of the GA 2023 organizing committee are going to join me on the stage. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> so collectively, this amazing group, led by the truly uber amazing Professor Richard Mackay, so this is the engine room. This is the industrial heritage of GA 2023. <laughs> they represent the focal points of all the components, all the many components of this event. The sustainability, functions and protocol, scientific symposium, heritage exposition, sponsorship, the heritage lecture, the side events, the social media, the youth forum, the posters, the social program, and everything in, bete in between. Look at these amazing volunteers. And let's celebrate them. As we have all discovered, GA 2023 has been a massive undertaking, and in this case, more than seven years of undertaking massively. So we have had a lot of time to get ready and a lot of time to pivot after the cancellation of GA 2020. It's been an incredible journey. GA 2023 has had many components. The ICOMOS business meetings and the General Assembly, the Youth Forum, the Scientific Symposium, including the Greater Blue Mountains day trip, the side events, the tours to many parts of Australia, and the Heritage Expo, of course, the public face of the GA, and a fantastic social program, including the wonderful open, opening ceremony at the Sydney Opera House, the fantastic, really fun party at Luna Park, and of course, this lovely closing ceremony. So now, of course, we, how, how are you feeling? Are you feeling changed? I did, in fact, change yeah. <laughs> from this morning. And now we have a right and a responsibility to party and celebrate uh, the end. 
GA 2023 was a feast of content, and I know it was difficult to decide which event to attend. I loved the hubbub of the talks in the three meeting places um, in the expo, as well as the more traditional presentations in the theatres. But sadly, of course, we are at an end, um, almost at an end, because now, as I said, um, we really want you to all join us for the fabulous um, final gala dinner tonight from 6 p.m. And of course, um, for those who uh, get up on time tomorrow morning, um, the Heritage Expo remains um, open tomorrow. Um, Steve and I will be there staffing the University of Canberra booth. We never give up. And um, of course, some of you will have to get up early to go on your buses. So for your um, post uh, tours. So I hope that the GA has changed you, and I hope that you take that change uh, back to your communities. I wish you a safe journey, no matter how far you have to travel. And I hope that you take with you um, the fabulous memories of these shared experiences, the new connections that you have made, and the challenges that we have all faced, and that wonderful, fizzy, delicious feeling of brain fizz when we all um, experience these new ideas um, together. Thank you and have a great party tonight. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>